I will speak in English because uh, the, the lecturer uh, is from the United States. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the lecture of Professor Sam Richards. I am Injin Yoon at Sociology Department who invited him to Korea University. Uh, as you know, Professor uh, Richard is an internationally well-known teacher and sociologist at Penn State University and the instructor of the largest race, gender, and cultural relations course in the United States. Uh, he's famous for his uh, teaching style that communicates with the students and draws their ideas and participation as much as possible. He also conducts research on Hallyu and promotes the social and cultural values of K contents to the world. Uh, the purpose of today's lecture is to seek a student-centered teaching and learning method where students uh, proactively explore, produce, and share knowledge for themselves rather than remain as passive learners. Uh, I believe that Professor Richard will give us uh, valuable lessons uh, to transform our classrooms into a forum for dialogue and program, uh, problem solving. Uh, please welcome him with a big round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Anyan Seo. Uh, I am uh, I'm really honored to be here, and thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it's really it's it's my honor, and uh, thank you for coming. Also, so I am. I'm going to just talk about teaching today, so not, not content. I mean, you'll see some content because I'm going to show a couple of videos, but I really want to talk about teaching. And, and what I'm going, the way, I, what I want to say or how I will say, uh, I, I'm going to introduce you to my style of teaching. And it is, it is one of many different styles. I have this idea that I think it's important that there are lots of pedagogies and methods and ways of doing this communication between the person standing up here and the people sitting where you are sitting. And I, and I think all the different styles are important, that we bring them all together. I just do, I do it one way. And I don't think that every course could do what I do or that every course, every instructor should do what I do. Um, but I think it's, um, but for me it, it works. It's a, it's, it's a valuative thing. So, um, the first thing that I want to talk about is it's myself, so you have an understanding of who I am and, and how I got to be, uh, to, to do the kinds of things that I do. Okay, so first, this is me, and um, that's my father. And so first off, from a very young age, I was very unconventional. You see that I'm dressed in pink, and so in the United States, I think, I'm, I don't know in Korea, but in the U.S., it, boy, they don't dress boys in pink. Um, today, we used to, though, by the way. Pink was the color of masculinity in the West. And then it changed uh, somewhere in the early 1900s, and it became blue. But boys always wore pink, which is, again, this is one of those sociology things that, you know, if you dig into the world, it's always more complex than we imagine it to be. By the way, I wore blue in honor of Korea University, so. <laughs> and, uh, and I had a doll and played with dolls. And my father was older when I was born, but then my father died when I was nine. And that really changed my life. So my father worked in a factory and he never went to high school, although he did take some college classes, but he really believed in science and he believed in reading. And so in my life, there were always books in the house. And I didn't read them, but I saw them, and it gave me a vision of the importance of books. And, uh, but when he died, I was on my own, and I had no guidance. And so I, was, I started working, I was buying my own school clothes at the age of 13. I, you know, we were really pretty poor. And, uh, and I didn't take school seriously. And so I was really a C student. 
I mean, I really was not, uh, and in high school, I didn't study. I, I was a really, <laughs> I was a bad boy in high school, okay? I won't say all the things that I did, but let me just say, uh, I didn't ever go to jail, so I'm okay. But I didn't, I didn't take school. I never looked at my report card. It didn't matter. I graduated in probably the lowest one-third of my high school class. And then I, then I went to college. And, and in, in going to college, I, I applied because I didn't know. It was very inexpensive. I applied to the only university that I could apply to. And they let me in. And I later found out that they let everybody in. So if you had money, you could go. So it was not like Korea University, and there were no tests. Um, and, and, well, I should say this. Um, I did take, you know, the, a, we have, you know, in the U.S., we have the, the SAT and the ACT, and I'm sure many of you took both of those. Um, but I scored in the 51st percentile. So I'm above average, and really, that, that's, for me, that's important. I want to be above average so, uh, on many things. So I'm above average as a teacher. I'm above average as a, as a lecturer. I just want to be above average. I don't want to be the best. I don't want to be below average. So 51 is really, really good. And, uh, and so that got me into college, though. But, of course, they didn't look at it. Uh, and I, I uh, no mind, what's really important is that if I had been in Korea, I never would have gone to college. I would not have been allowed to go to college. I mean, I don't know, are there some universities that I could pay to get into? Are there universities that, with my grades? There's even like a small, maybe, okay, so like a trade school or something, right? Um, after two and a half years in college, I was a, I was a musician, I played drums, I worked, I did lots of things. Um, after two and a half years, I was still a freshman, and I, had, and I was on probation because my GPA in college was 1.9. And, and mind you, I, I liked to read. I was a reader. Like, in high school, I would skip school, and I would go hide in the library, and I would skip classes, and I would go hide in the library, and I would read because my classes were boring and not very interesting. They probably were interesting, but I didn't understand how to to really learn, and so, but I would sit in the back of the library and I would read, and I read all sorts of books. I, was, I would go to the, to the library as a kid, and I would bring home a stack of books like this, and I would read them, and then I would, you know, go get another set of books. But my grades, I got C's and D's, you understand. I think, I, I don't remember because I didn't look at my report card, but it, so, uh, then one day, I was, I was 20 years old, I went, to, I had transferred to what we, what we have as a two-year college. And I said, well, I'm never going to get a four-year degree. Maybe I'll get a two-year degree. And I had already started a business, and I thought, like, maybe I can just have something, right? I started, I have four classes. I stopped going to three of them. I had one more class. And I said, you know, if I stop going now, I will never go back to college. This will be the end of my college possibility, right? And so I was on my way to class, and I saw the library. And I said, I don't feel like going to class. And I went in the library, and I sat, I started going, looking up and down, and this is what I would do. I would go to the library, and you should try this sometime. You know, on a, on, a fr on a Friday night or a Saturday night or some night when you would normally be out with your friends, go to the library and just spend time just looking at books you would never look at. And it's, it's magical. And so I, would, I, I, I was walking around and I saw something and I pulled it out and it was a journal about prisons. And, and I started looking at it. And for the first time in my life, I said, I think this looks really interesting. Like, ah, this is really, it's just something clicked. And I said, I could do that. And I walked over to the, to the wall, and there was a phone on the wall, and I picked up the phone, and I called the social work department because it was a social work journal. And I said, hey, can I speak with somebody? And they said, 
yeah, come over right now. So I went over, I signed up for social work, for sociology and social work. They were together at the time. And I, and I that next quarter, I was going to start all over. So I didn't go to class. I went home. I told my b bandmates, because I was in a band, and we were playing all the time. And I said, I'm quitting the band in five weeks. I went to my work, and I said, I'm quitting work in five weeks. And I became a student for the first time in my life. Like, I did nothing but study. I went, I would, I would go to the university in the morning. I was, I was a commuter, we say. And I went to the university in the morning, and I would stay all day and all night, and I would read in the library. And I, and I was getting C's because I didn't have skills. You know, I couldn't write, I couldn't, but I could read. And I was a really creative thinker because I was reading, I had my whole life I had been reading books from all over the world, but I, I didn't have skills. I didn't know how to take a test. And so I, uh, mind you, the 51st percentile, I didn't know what that test was. I just, someone said, you have to take this test. And I showed up one morning and I'm not going to say or deny that I might have been hung over from drinking the night before, but uh, I just said, I, that's just what happened as a hungover 17-year-old, okay? So it's not that I wasn't smart, but I didn't know how to take tests. And so, but one day I got, in one class I got a B, and I said, oh, a B, okay, I can do this. And then I kept working, and I got a D and a C, and then I got an A. And I said, and it was the first day I ever got in my life, except in high school, I got an A in typing. So I'm really, I'm really good at typing. And uh, so, and then I just kept going. And I, I woke up. I mean, I said, I, I am going to be, I am going to understand the world. And this is all I want to do. And so I became a student. Now, mind you, so... I was now 21, 20 years old. So again, understand, if I had been in Korea, I wouldn't be standing here today. And so that started my journey. And I've never stopped. And the good thing about me, or good thing about this journey, is that I meet many people, many young people, who by the time they get into my classes, and they're really good students, but they're, they're burned out. Because they have spent their entire lifetime working so hard, like, like all of every student in this class and every professor, but every student, you, you have worked so hard to get here that at any moment, you're on the edge of being burned out. So most of you, some of you are not, but most of you, because that's just the nature of life. I didn't have any of that. So when I started at 20, I, I had so much, my muscles were, I hadn't used anything. I was, I was ready, and I'm still in that place today. I wake up every day, and I can't wait to op open up my computer, op start thinking, planning things out. I mean, it is just a glorious experience. So anyway, um, I uh, went, I finished my undergrad. At the, where I did my undergrad, remember, it's a university that had to accept me, it was the only place that would accept me for my master's degree in sociology. So I changed from social work to sociology. And by the way, I did it because I took one sociology class. It was social psychology for the sociologists here. And I said, this is the absolute most interesting stuff I have ever read in my life. Because sociology teaches, you, teaches us about the invisible strings that are shaping our lives in the ways that we don't see. This is the sociological imagination. So we're like puppets. And we're just like, we're being, these strings are, you know, moving us and they're sh shifting our thinking and our actions and so much. And they're invisible. We don't see them. And we think that we're really operating on our own terms. I'm thinking about what I want to do. I mean, it's all about me. But the truth is, what sociology teaches us is that these strings, they're organized in very complex and fascinating ways, according to our culture and our class and our gender and our sex and all these things around us. And that 
that they're, they're not only shaping my behavior, but they're shaping the behavior of everybody else who's in this kind of group that I'm in. And so I started learning that in social psychology, and it was the first time in my life I realized I'm not in control entirely. Like, and the degree to which I think I'm in control, I'm really not in control. And so that, that awakened me. You know, as, come on, you think about this, right? When somebody comes along and tells you that something is shaping your behavior, and you don't even know what it is, and you can't see it. Like, that makes you really curious to say, well, what is that? Well, that's why you study sociology. You see, that's, that's why this is such an awesome field. But um, I went on, then, then after I did my master's degree, and then I, did my, I applied for a PhD program at Rutgers University, and I, and I got in. And, uh, and then I went to Rutgers, and I did my PhD. But my area of focus, I was saying this to some of your professors, earlier. My area of focus is Latin America. From a, a young age as an undergrad, I, was re, I, I learned sp Spanish. I traveled to Spain and learned Spanish. And I, I'm, a, I'm a Latin American studies person. So I've lived a long time in Latin America and I study many different countries and so on. Um, so anyway, I came back up from Latin America. Oh wait. And this is what I looked like when I started at Penn State University. Right? By the way, that's the Western depiction of Jesus, you know? And so, uh, imagine if I didn't have glasses. So I was working in Ecuador with priests and nuns, Catholic priests and nuns, and we would go travel into the countrysides, and, and oftentimes on horseback. And we, we, would, we were meaning, um, the, what in, in, in Spanish is campesinos. Campesinos are small, small farmers. And their whole lives, They've been told by the priests and the nuns that Jesus is coming. He's going to return. And the images of Jesus looked kind of like that, without the earring, you know. And, and so sometimes I, we would come into the community and people would go to, come up to the priest and say, Padrecito, like, is that him? Is that Jesus? So I have the experience of being seen as Jesus in my life, which is kind of cool. If you're a Christian, that's a, re even if you're not a Christian, that's kind of a cool thing. I'm not a Christian, but I certainly enjoyed that. It's a powerful experience. Okay, so that's what I look like. And I show you that photo uh, because I'm very unconventional. I was always unconventional. And from an early age, I, I realized I didn't need to, nor did I want to follow the, the path that pretty much everybody else follows. I decided I was going to pursue my own path. I knew I didn't need money. I knew that money would come to me or it would not come to me. And I was a house painter. I learned how to paint houses. That's one thing I was doing at a young age. And I was really good at it and I made a lot of money. So I always knew that in the end I could paint houses and I could read books and I could study and I could paint houses. And painting, painting is very meditative. It's a very kind of zen-like kind of a, it's very, it's very quiet, very centering activity. And so for me, it's a, it's a spiritual experience as well. So I knew I could do that. So I always followed my own path. I didn't need to follow, and I, and, I, and I didn't know what that path would be. I knew it would be unconventional, and so, of course, you know, it really has been. Um, but now I want to talk about, uh, let me, let me, so let me just show you. So I started teaching at Penn State 31 years ago, and over time, my, my teaching and my way of being has evolved into this. This is the trailer for my class, so... Um.
sounds great. Yeah. Uh, what, so, so tw twice a week for 15 weeks in a semester, two semesters a year, so that's 60 classes per year. It's, I put together a, a, what is really a, a, tele, a, a production. So it's somewhere between a classroom and a t show, I don't know. I don't know what you would call it, but it's a production. And I write a script. I mean, it's not scripted out, but I write the script. I kind of know where I'm going. I have an idea of the, 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 con the ideas that I want students to leave with. I have an idea. I know what the questions are that I want students to wrestle with. You know, and, and I know also that in the middle of class, new questions will come up or people will have questions that I don't even know what they are. But, I'm, but I do this 60 times a year. No class is ever the same. So year after year after year, you could watch, every class is recorded for the past five years, every class is up on YouTube. You could watch five years of classes and not a single class is ever the same. And they're not the same because I'm bringing other people up or talking to people from some other part of the world. I'm saying something different, students say something different, it's all, everything is, has, a, has a different way of being in the world. So that, that's kind of a sense of what's going on. Now, um, let me talk about this. Think back to your high school. I usually ask people who have, well, so for the, those of you who, who are professors and instructors, I would ask, think back to your undergraduate days. And to the rest of you, I would say, think back to your high school. What do you remember? What facts do you remember? If I, say, if I gave you the microphone up here, said here, Come take this microphone. And what I want you to do is I want you, we have, we, we now, we have a, we have almost, you know, 50 minutes. So you have 50 minutes to tell the rest of the, this gathering here everything you remember from your undergraduate years or from your high school years. Now, if you think about all the time you spent as a student, so it's four years, four years, whatever it is, three, four years, that's a lot of time you spent in a classroom. Taking notes, learning facts, reading information, having information, downloading information into your brain from teachers and professors. How much do you actually remember? So one day as a teacher, and I, and I remember this distinctly, I was putting together PowerPoint slides and I was you know, kind of putting my notes together with information and so on. Um, and I thought, my students aren't going to remember any of this. And I said, what, what am I doing? Right? Like, what am I doing? Now, mind you, this is me. I, again, this is really important. I don't think my style of teaching is for everybody. I don't think my style of not being interested, not downloading or uploading, I would say for me it's uploading facts and ideas into the minds of students, is for everybody. I'm only talking about me. And I had this realization that said, I, well, I asked myself, I said, what do you remember from your from your undergraduate year? So I'm, you know, I'm always putting myself in the shoes of people in the seats of students, right? And I thought, I remember one thing, one thing, that's it. And the one thing I remembered, it's a really crazy thing. You know, in a courtroom, when you have a jury, and you have a, I don't, I don't know about juries or, I don't know about this in Korea. Um, in the US, so we have juries. So maybe there's 10 or 12 people who are going to decide the case for whatever the case is in a trial. And you go in the courtroom and you sit at a, all, all, usually it's a table and it's an oblong table, you know, like the size of this panel here. And there's, let's say, 12 seats around it. And I had this class. And it's really interesting that I, I'm telling you this. I don't think I've ever told anybody this. And this person studied juries. 
And he said, you know, if you're ever on a jury and you want to be the spokesperson for the jury, sit at the end of the table. You have like a 38 or a 42% greater chance of being the spokesperson for the jury if you sit at the end of the table. People will pick you. And I remembered that. And I said, oh my God, that's the only thing I remember from four years of college education. And I said, I don't remember anything from my undergraduate years. And I thought, this is, this is, insa- this is for me, a recipe of insanity. Like, why am I doing this? And so I decided in that moment, for me, once again, this is really important. I think there are many classes in which it's very important to give information. Whatever it is, it doesn't, but not for me. And I said, I'm done. I'm going to teach sociology differently. And, and, I, and so I go into my classroom and I say, hey, if you want facts, you have these things. Right there, this, this, the, this is the most one of the most powerful computers in human history. Everything, everything you could ever know is right here. If you want facts, look it up. Like right here, sit in your seat. You can do it in my class, it's fine. You can have your phones, pull your phones out, look up facts. Don't ask me, because first off, I don't know what facts you're gonna want, I, so I, I have no idea. Learn to use your phone. My students, students in the United States, are terrible researchers. They have no idea how to use the phone to research information. And I think, how do you, how do you not know that? This is, this, is, this is a miracle. Right here, this is a miracle. I spend at least four hours a day on my computer or on my phone looking up facts and information because this is what I do for a living, you know? So I think, oh my God. So I tell my students, if you want facts, look it up on your, on your own. But that's not, that's not my job. If you want information, if you want definitions to sociology terms, look it up on your own. I teach a class on racism, like race and ethnicity and culture. My students never receive a definition of race, ethnicity, and culture. Because there are so many definitions out there. I say, if you want one, look it up. I don't, there's, you could, you could read for weeks about definitions of those three terms. I'm not going to waste time with that. I got, we have other things to do. Um, in memorization, I said, okay, you, you're not going to remember anything from my class. You know, here's one thing that happened. For quite a number of years, I would leave class and I would see my students, you know, like walking across campus or something and a student would say, hey, that was a really great class today. And I, I would say, oh, huh, what did you like about it? And they would say, well, you know, it was just really interesting. I said, you know, I, yeah, okay. But what did you like? What was interesting? Well, you know, the stuff you were talking about, mm, mm, when you were talking about the way human beings mm, live and, I don't know, in urban versus rural, and, and then they mumble, and I said, well, what about that? Well, you know, and I realized after years of trying to get from students, extract from them something that they really could remember from my class, five to 10 minutes after it was over, I got nothing. And then not only that, the most disturbing piece was that I teach very highly controversial subject matters. So if you ever watch any of my videos, you, and I'm gonna show you a couple here, Quickly. you will know that this is very controversial. I mean, it's not really, but I'm just willing, I'm just willing to talk about anything. And people are often not willing to talk about everything. But for me, I am. Anything you want to talk about, we can talk about. And so I'm not afraid because I really think that I just have a sense. I, I love life. I love human beings. I, I, I can go to the dark side, I can go to the light side, it's all good. But I sometimes touch in these really controversial things, okay? Students, I would hear from somebody, one of my colleagues, oh hey, you know, your student, I heard from one of your students that you said X in class, right? And I would say, actually, that's not what I said at all. I said the opposite of that. Oh. And then I would hear like another time the same thing. 
And people would and always misconstrue what it was that I was saying. Misconstrue, right? So they, they would misunderstand. And I said, okay, this is silly. Why am I going to get them to memorize? They can't remember anything. They can't remember a basic idea that I gave. The most important idea that I would present to the class, they couldn't even remember that. So I said, this is crazy. So what I decided as a result of that, well, my job is to inspire. I'll ask you, who do you remember from high school or college? And those of you who are Korea University KU students, do you say KU? Do you, KU? Okay, KU students. And who, which, who do you remember? Which professors do you remember? What do you, who? Yeah. So I thought to myself, I was thinking, who do I remember? And I said, I remember the people who, the inspirational people. I remember the people who inspired me to think. They didn't tell me what to think. They inspired me to think. And they were the ones who said, keep going. Ask a different question. Ask it a different way. Imagine you don't have the answer. Imagine your answer is wrong. Come up with another one. Keep going. Think outside the box. All the fish are swimming this way. Swim the other way. No matter what people, what, what you think, everybody around you thinks, take the opposite position and try to argue for that. Imagine that everybody is wrong constantly. And I had some professors who were so inspirational. And I would sit in their classrooms and I would just, I, I wanted, I, it's not that I wanted to be like them, but I wanted to be able to think like them. I wanted to think on my own terms. I wanted to come up with my own thoughts and theories and ways of seeing things. And so they inspired me to be better than what I was. That no matter, no matter what, A, I'm never going to have the answer to the most interesting questions of life. I will never have an answer because the most interesting questions don't have answers. Even the basic sociology ones, you know, we were talking this morning about just some sociology that's like you can't, you, you, just, you just feel it. You, all you can do is sort of feel the answer, but you know you're never going to really get there because it's just when you think you have it, it goes through your fingers, you know. So I thought, these are the people I remember. And I realized that's my job for my students. I, I want to inspire them. And you know, I'm just going to do what I'm really here to do and what students have been telling me for, since the very first class I ever taught, students have been telling me that I do, which is they get them to think. And I used to try to research this and you know, and I would try to, I actually did a couple studies on it to like pick my, the, to get into the brains of my students and say like, but what do you mean I get you to think? Like I inspire you to think and they'd be like, ah, they, they couldn't say what it was, but they just knew that it was happening. I confused them. They left every class more confused than when they came in. And I thought, I've done my job. Because if you're confused, you got to go figure it out. Now, you don't have to. You could just turn your brain off. But if you're, if you're, if you're born to be a thinker, right? If you're here for, if you're at, at KU, because you want to get a job and you want to make money and then when, once you get out of KU and you graduate, you just turn your brain off. And, and don't, like, I, you know, I've heard this from uh, young Koreans a lot. You know, it's called like the, 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 the brain swiping, right? One, one student called it brain swiping. You know, you, you study for a, an exam and you just fill up all your brain and then as soon as you take the exam, you swipe it clean. You wipe it clean because you have to fill it up again for the next exam. So if, you're, if, this, if that's your life, then okay, that's fine. Then, you know, go do your thing, get your job and turn, turn your brain off. And, and it, life is very difficult, my friends. When you get to my age, you know, if you think it's difficult now, wait till you're at my age and you have lived a life 
And you have to ask yourself, did I live a good enough life? Did I live the life that I was supposed to live? Did I live the life that really brought my potential to the, to the surface? Right? And, but if, if the way to, to do that is to kind of turn your brain off, just get your degree and do what you have to do and move on, then that, that's really wonderful. But if, you're, but if you're a thinker and you're born to be a thinker, that's a different story. That's far more complex. And that's what I do. And that's what I try to do with my students. Now, mind you, I don't always I inspire. I mean, obviously, I mean, I don't. But I inspire me, <laughs> you know? I don't, I don't teach. Like, people think, oh, you, you, really, you really enjoy helping students. I'm like, no, I don't. I don't care about students, actually. Like when you've had so I've had 50, I have 60, 70,000 students in my life. I really don't, it, that's not what motivates me. What motivates me when, every time I walk into the classroom is like, I want to think differently. I want to be motivated. And I get tired talking to myself. And I, don't, I, need, I need more information, and so I talk to students. That's why I bring students up to the front of the class, and I say, now you tell me. That's why we, we, we have video conferences with people from around the world. We ask them questions. Like, that's why I'm here. I'm not here, like, okay, I'm here now talking, but, and I'm, I'm here in Korea, and I'm, you know, giving a number of talks and some, doing a couple television things and so on, but that's not why I'm in Korea. I'm in Korea to listen to Koreans. Last night I had a, a conversation with a, a journalist who had interviewed me a year ago in one of your stations. And I said, can, you know, can, can we have dinner? And I just want to talk to you. I want to hear from you. I want, to, I want to interview you. And she had spent three years living in Canada. And I said, so, oh, you're like, you're, you're one of those people. Like, you have something to say. You really do. You've lived in these two worlds. I want to I wanna pick your brain, right? That's why I teach. That's my motivation, to, to grow. I want to answer those difficult questions of life, right? Okay, so let me just show you. Uh, I want to, I want to, I want to really, I want to, I want to hear, I want some questions, but I want to just show you a couple short clips. And if you haven't seen any I'm assuming most of you have not seen clips from my class. Uh, but these are just two. And, I, and I'm doing these because they involve Asian and Asian American students. And so the first one is, uh, well, let me, let, I'll let you watch it and we'll see how, you, how much you. Um, uh, what's da- how's the dating scene for you? Have you ever dated? Who do you date? Wait, are you straight, by the way? What's that? Bye. Bye? Who do you date? I mean, I'm not really in the dating scene right now, but I mean, I guess attractive people. Dude, you might be after today's class. There's a nice close-up of you on the screen. You might get some attention. All right. All righty. So who do you, have you, have you had any experiences with that of you, of you, of people not being interested in you because you're an Asian man? Yes. A little bit. Can you, do you have any stories or anything, any way you could say that? Not really stories, but I guess some people just don't find, let's say, Asian men attractive, uh-huh. or they're looking for a specific type of person. Yeah. Uh, and I guess that that's just how society is. Um, Asian men are just not perceived as either masculine, or um, they just seem too into their studies to even focus on their relationship. Um, yeah. There's just a lot of stereotypes that are out there that probably... Um, make people think differently and already have a perception on Asian men. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Before. See, see how he's teaching? He's doing my job. I should pay him, right? But see, he's teaching. He has something to say about his... I can, t- I can say this, but you see, if you, if you just... You, you, you give someone the microphone and you ask them a question, they have something to say. Right now, mind you, that wasn't a very good question I asked him because it was a closed-ended question. But, you know, everybody has something to offer. Or they even get to really know the person. Yeah. So one of the things that we see in particular 
um, this, what this research study was, was they were looking at like how, like the two, like you two guys, like how much in order to be, to be as, um, to compete, hang, hang on, bro, just come here really fast. Like, say with this guy, he's taller, so that, but like, just to compete with this guy on the market, he's just an average looking white dude, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay, dude, you're really handsome, actually. He's a really handsome looking white guy. And, no, but to compete with him on the dating market, what this study was, what they were looking at was how much more money these two guys have to make, how much more they have to be. In how much more educated, how much more money they have to make, et cetera, et cetera, to get as much attention, say, on like dating websites as this dude, right? What's your name, bro? Justin. Justin, as Justin. And it's really a lot. And the issue is what you're saying is like people, Asian men, are not, are not seen as desirable sexual partners or in any way. Thanks, dog. It's $200,000, by the way. And see, see that this guy right here, this. This guy, he's Chinese. the irony is, he later worked for me. He's he he's rich, <laughs> like he he drove he drove like a Maserati. Like this guy was rich, you know. So that's the that is also the irony of of this kind of thing, you know. Yeah, yeah man, nice hair by the way. <laughs> all right, so okay, do what about, do you all have? To, have you, are you, are, are you all on the dating scene? Are you on the dating market? Do you find Asian men attractive? Dude, all the Asian men in the world are listen, are waiting for your answer. Do you find Asian guys attractive? You don't? I, I apologize, but I do not find Asian men attractive, no. Whoa, all right. Go ahead. And you? Yeah, I don't really either. You don't either? No offense to like anyone. Whoa, all right. Where do you think that's from? Like, do you have any thoughts on that? Dude, hang on, Jack, come here a second. Look at this guy. Now, so listen, understand. I want to just show you something. This was a few years ago, right? I, I'm, I, my, my whole way, I've just slowed down a little bit, but um, do you have any thoughts about that? So I, I jumped and went somewhere else, but do you have any, what are your thoughts about that? That's such a good question. Like, so you get someone to answer that. Like, what are your thoughts? And then students get a chance to, to say. Now, mind you, we're in the United States. So what happens with international... So a lot of you, and the students in here would say, oh, my God, if I was at Penn State, I would never talk. I couldn't do that. Well, yeah, but you couldn't if you were a first-year student. But, but, you know, like, you know, you, you study in the U.S., and... Or you st and, and like after a semester or a year, you start to kind of adapt to the way people are. And many of the students like early on would say, I'd be too shy to, to get, get the microphone and talk. But after a year or two, people, you know, it's, a gr it's an experience. And I have lots of international students who want to be in front of the class. They want to take the microphone. They just want to have that experience. So here. I'll do this. Look fine. at this guy. Come on, man. He's like a really handsome dude. What's not attractive about him? Okay, so the, I think... The sweater, I, maybe? I, I think, think what? the issue is... Like, like, he's, he looks nice. I think the issue is that I grew up around white people, so, what I, so in movies and media you portray white guys as attractive and also as the only Asian person. Every Asian guy I've been around with, people assume they're my brother because of all the white people. Oh, right, I got so, it. So, I don't know if it's construed from, oh, he looks like me, he could be related to me, maybe. Yeah. Dude, I'm, I'm telling you. Do, you. do you have any thoughts on that? Do you have a thought on that? Wait. I mean, I've had, let's say, Asian Oops. girl, like female friends that pretty much just said, not to me personally, but they just said they're not attracted to Asian men. To Asian guys. Yeah. Who are they attracted to? Typically white guys, but I think that's just society as a whole. Are you straight? Are you on the dating yes. scene at all? No. <laughs> yeah, that's because your parents might watch this one day. If you were, who would you be dating? I think I'm the only one out of everyone that's actually into Asian people. <laughs> oh, really? You're into Asian people? 
All right. Yeah. What does I that mean, mean? What do you mean? Um, I mean, my parents would prefer if I actually date an Asian person. So it's like ingrained in me to be like, oh, like, I should probably look for Asian boys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you probably should, and then it's just fine that you do. And you travel back to Taiwan a lot, you said? Yeah. So it's for you, it's more mm -hmm. natural. All right. I think it's actually really, if I... Do, do, pull the next one up. Yeah. Hey, so... Um, this video, by the way... Good grammar and spelling one, are important. I, I got more email from... Um, not just Asian American men, but, Asi but men from Korea, Taiwan, China, more email on this, this video than any, any video I've ever done. And what they say is, thank you for talking about this. Like, thank you. Like, no, I've never ever seen anybody talk about this issue. And with my students, you know, they, they just talk about what a struggle it is. I, I've had, I had men, men there, there was a, a, a gentleman, he was uh, Korean uh, English. Uh, I mean, he lived in London, but he was of Korean ancestry. He said, I, I've been suicidal for years. He said, I haven't had a date in 10 years. I can't, get, I can't find anybody who's interested in me, not even um, East Asian women who are here. And, he's, and he said, I, you know, I've been suicidal for years. And like, I really so appreciate the fact that you're willing to put this issue out there. It really gave me hope to say, no, no, it's okay. Just, and he said, if you ever want me to speak in your class, and I get this a lot from people, I'll be happy to speak in your class. I mean, this is really... Okay, there's one more then. I want to just show you this other one, and then we'll take questions. Because, Nicole, I want you to pick out of these three guys... This was a different Which one semester. Is the most handsome. <laughs> okay? Now here's the deal. So here's the deal. You gotta like, now you're gonna have to keep your, your gla glasses are cool, but you're gonna wanna go with glasses on and glasses off. And you guys, what you wanna do is, you, you gotta, come on, man. You, this is, I'm trying to get you a date. You know what I mean? Do you have a boyfriend, by the way? You don't? Dude, all right, this is it. So, do you have a girlfriend, bro? Boyfriend? Wait, are you guys straight? Yeah. Are you straight? All right. Do any of you have a girlfriend? So the stakes just got raised a lot higher. Okay, so here. Uh, look, at, you, you look at him really closely. Okay. I mean, look at him. To turn to the side. Gentlemen, come on, man. I'm trying to hook you up here, right? <laughs> not, no, not, hang on. No, not in that way. All right, sorry. That's old school. So, bro, take your glasses off real fast. Okay, look, look be cool. Dude, you don't want to stand like that. That's not cool. Just be like, you can do it, bro. No, I'm, I'm going to help him You got to look at him closely. Go, just, it's okay. You're, you're like, dude, it's like you're at a, a you're, are you, you're in a sorority, right? Which sorority? I can't say right in here. Yeah. Yeah. Alpha, what is it? AKO. AKO. So imagine you're at your sorority. There's a mixer going on, and these three chaps show up. And, you got, and you're going to go on, on a date with one of them. So you've got to pick out which one's the most handsome. Are you guys comfortable with this? Are we good? You all right? Okay. All right. So look at them carefully. No, you're going to pick out. First off, what are you looking for? I don't know. Like Hang on. Go ahead. Talk right in the mic. So they're all like the same height, so that's like, that's one thing that's you just, they're all the same, so. They're all the same. All right. I meant by the height. Oh wait, hang on. I meant okay, like the height, on. that they're all the same height. So okay, go ahead. Like How else? Three of them what the else? What else are you looking for? I don't, I don't know. Talk right in the mic. I don't know. Hey, I'm wait, by the way, it's okay. You're not like, no, we're not, we're not, I'm not setting you up to be racist or something like that. That's not what this is. This is actually a really, really cool exercise. So what I really want you to do is look at them and tell me what, you, what is appealing and is most appealing and least appealing about them. Are we cool with that? No, 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 it's okay. That's what, you guys are cool, right? Dude, you're all right. I got your back on this. 
because you have clearly when the hair, you're going to win the hair one, all right? So go ahead. What do you think? You've never dated Asian guys, right? No. <laughs> have you ever? Okay, so here we go. Talk right into the mic. You can't say anything racist. You're, you're saying, like, what do you like about different ones? Like, what do you, look at their eyes, right? Like, their noses, the hair, the whole thing. The way they're dressed. Come on, man. They're like, they got some style going on here, dog. So one thing to think about is that I've already talked about, this is a sociology class, and we do biology. Like, I'm looking at people's faces. I have students come up, you know, students of Europe, Africa, Asia. By the way, I, I'm only showing you these two videos. The, I, these are probably the only, I have 3,000 videos. I mean, I talk about tons of issues. This is just, these are just two that I grabbed because I thought, okay, it would be really interesting for this, but we could, I'm talking about stuff from all over the world. We talk about faces. We look at faces. We look at eyes and ears and you know for why it is that people have different shaped body features and why some people have straight hair and curly and coiled and textured hair and taller and shorter and like and so I'm teaching people to look at other human beings like look at one another because our body features the, are all about where our ancestors evolved our body features were given to us through, through, through our ancestry and genetics and the environment. And so like, okay, let's look at that. So I'm teaching people the uncomfortable reality of really looking at people on their own terms. Not from the sociology stuff. Look on our own terms. Stop the judgment. Because you know, for me, in this particular case, there are no standards of beauty. Beauty is just, beauty is a social construction. Everything that any of us find attractive or unattractive, that is a social construction. Sociology teaches us that the world puts that into our heads. That doesn't come from nature. And so, so I'm teaching my students in the end, the lesson after this, to all of them, and these three guys were great, by the way, and they talked to them before class. They knew what they were getting into, but the lesson is you, for her, the, she's never ever looked at anybody but a white man as a, as, as an, to assess whether another man is or is not attractive. She only looked at white men. She never even, she would see an Asian man and she wouldn't even look at him. She would see a black man, and she wouldn't even look at him. He, was, he didn't even exist. The only people that she looked for as a potential mate were white men. And that's the lesson. Where did you get that? Why is that? What is behind that? And this is the controversial stuff that I walk into because she is, and the whole class is asking themselves, whoa, like, I do that. I'm doing that. How is that? Huh. And so I can only do something like this when, when in, the, in, the, in the, these moments when the room gets really quiet. And it's quiet and people feel like, oh, there's tension in the room. No, no, there's not tension. What's going on in those moments is everybody's thinking. And what they're saying is, that's me. That's me. And this is what sociology has to teach me. And if I don't build, if I don't bring students up and I don't let them teach other people and there is, and, 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 if, and, and, and do it with a little bit of kind of tension in the room, not knowing where it's going to go, but my students trust me. They trust that I got this, right? First off, I'm not judging them because They've already heard me talking about beauty standards. There's no, there are no beauty standards. Like they, please. I'm a sociologist, right? Straight hair, long hair, lips, what, I don't know, anything. That's all just created for us. If I, said, if I said to anybody, hey, listen, man, here's what you really need. The most beautiful person in the world is 
three feet high and four feet wide. Everybody would be trying to stunt their growth so they'd be three feet high and four feet wide. And everybody else would learn that that is what is attractive. And we all say, like, oh, no, not me. I choose. I have my own thinking. No, you don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. And so I'm using students to teach other students that we all pretty much think the same way. And we're all puppets. We're all puppets. And, like, that's pretty cool. And if you leave going saying, like, yeah... Yeah, I got that. And by the way, this, this guy, the guy right here, um, he said some really fun things. And at the end, and he, and a couple weeks later, he, got, he went out on a date. Not with her, but with another white woman in class. And it was the first date that he ever had with anybody who is not Asian. But some white woman said, like, I got to meet that guy. Because he was really kind of funny and so on. So, like... I'm like, okay, there it is. <laughs> I, I, then I went to my, my boss and I said, hey, I'll put a, I'm, I got a dating game going on here. This is cool. Uh, I don't think I, I don't, I don't know if I have, uh, I don't think I, yeah, hang on. It's fine. I'm just going to do a final. Can we just do, I'm going to say this really, but no, I'm not. Just, we're done. How, I'm finished. I mean, I could talk for hours, as you might imagine, but how about some questions? Um, thanks, by the way. Thanks for doing that. Yeah. I'd love to hear. I'd love to hear questions from students. Yeah. Wait. Is there a mic? Do we have a microphone? We do, right? Uh, hi. Thank you for your talk, by the way. Uh, Hold the mic really close. Remember, I, have, I was a drummer, so I have, he, I have uh, tinnitus. I have, I have a symphony orchestra playing in my ears at all moments, so talk re as loudly as you can. Um, so, yeah, thank you for your talk again, and yeah. it was very inspiring, and I think you're good at it. And also, um, it was very reassuring for me because, you know, people often tell me that a rebel like you who wears earrings and tattoos are not going to make wait, it. Wait, oh wait, hang on one second. Can you just pull, <laughs> just pull your mask off and talk into oh, it? Oh, sure, yeah. yeah. if you could. Yeah. Yeah, people would tell, often tell me, like, rebels like you who wears uh, tattoos and piercings would not stand where you stand right now. So yeah. um, that was very uh, reassuring for me. Uh, here's my main question. Um, so um, I'm a master's student here at KU, and mm -hmm. I'm... I'm considering a PhD pro uh, program in the United States, and my, re uh, my research question that I want to pursue is how the growing prominence of Asian and Asian American in the United States uh, has affected how uh, the mainstream society of America and Asian American community perceive each other and how that mm -hmm. affects mm -hmm. the uh, acculturative strategies for yeah. Asian Americans and yeah well as you know like I mean I don't have to explain that Korean or Asian yeah. media has seen a lot of uh, recognition from mm -hmm. American society recently and well I'm sure you've done a lot of like interviews and talks about this too but as a teacher as someone who interacts with his students a lot in his class, and especially Asian students. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to hear from you, like, what have you found different, or what have you found something like special yeah. in yeah. the uh, interactions between yeah. Asian students and the rest of the students? Yep. So there are a couple things. One, the the really rapid growth of the of of uh, people of Asian ancestry in the United States has taken off in the last. In, in the last 30 years, right? I mean, it, it's just, uh, it's profound. You know, the influence of Asia on, first off, on the entire world, let's face it, right? I mean, this is what, what, what the one thing we're obviously seeing with Korea, um, but also in the United States. And so there is a greater kind of uh, assimilation 
of all aspects of Asian culture. And by the way, K culture has profoundly influenced that. I mean, this is the thing that I'm, what I'm, I'm known for, you know, here in Korea, talking about K culture and the degree to which, at absolutely, you, Koreans, have had a have opened doorways in the United States that you really cannot imagine. And this is how you, you know, I mean, this is the wave. The wave has crashed over, right? It's no, it's not a wave. It's actually a tsunami. You know how a tsunami wave is. It's, a, it, it's invisible. You don't really see it. It's not like a wave that crashes like this. It's the one that comes this way. And it's, wow, it is profound. And so what's really important, you know, most recently we have this, you know, the, the hatred, because of COVID, you know, hatred of Asians or attacks on Asians. And to which I want to say, and I was telling this to my journalist colleague last night, the journalists, because they have to tell a story, but I'm a sociologist. And I look at numbers. And you got 17 million people of Asian ancestry in the United States. And you know, the attacks on Asians went from 2,500 to 3,800. So it's almost you know, like a 100%, 80% increase or whatever, right? But most of those attacks are name calling. And so the actual physical violence is you know, 300, let's say, right? You got 17 million people, 300 attacks. The journal, if you read journalism, what you see is, oh, you know, this is like, a ta you know, stop Asian hate, right? They're, they're so, here's another story of a, of a woman of Chinese ancestry attacked with a, a club by somebody in San Francisco. Okay, well, th that's a problem, right? But 300 out of 17 million people, it's like, this, you, you have to, this is the beauty of sociology and numbers. You gotta put numbers together. You, you know, it's like flying on an airplane. The airplane isn't where you're gonna have a problem. It's driving in a car to the airport. That's the dangerous part of your trip. And so, so, so what, what happens is, when you're on the ground in the United States, and it depends on where you are, there's a, just an immense amount of, of coming together and assimilation. And especially because of Korea, I'm, I'm telling you, right, in the past five to six years, the number of people who have just opened to Asia, because people don't know the difference between Koreans and Chinese or Vietnamese and Cambodia. I mean, this is not the Taiwanese. I mean, you know, whatever. A, but Korea's opened certain doorways that is like really profound, you know. So yeah, I find that. You know, now there are these kinds of things, right? But this, this, both these videos were from four years ago. And in four years, because of Korea, once again, because of K-pop in particular and K-dramas, it's like, there is a lot more really people kind of blending, I'm seeing it among my students. So, and I have a big class, so I see that. So that's what I would say, yeah. It's a really exciting time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Actually, could you take that to somebody else? I don't have a mask on, so it'll be, who else would like to ask a question? I know I'm gonna talk to some professors afterwards, so like, I'll have a chance to, who, who would like to ask a question? That's a great question. No, yeah. Just some, you gotta have, come on, hang on. All right, there we go. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh. Same thing, if you could just pull the mask aside because oh. I can't hear otherwise. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, first of all, thank you for your lecture. And mm -hmm. uh, my question is like, um, I think student participation is really important, especially in your class, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the question, asking a question is always like kind of problem with me because it, it is really hard for me to ask a good question and mm -hmm. how can I ask people about great things? Yeah, kind of that. So I want to ask, I want to hear from you about a question like, how can you, like, I mean, how can you make a good question and what do you think that good question are? Oh, yeah. oh my God. <laughs> See, this is students, you got it. This is the, that is a brilliant question right there. You just asked one, right? And what did you say? You know what you say is like, you said how. How do you ask a good question, right? And how opens me up to, I can answer, you're, now, once you put it in, I'm here, I'm on this big stage, right? You ask how. Now, how? Huh. 
I can go over here and answer. I can go here and answer. I can go, there are so many ways I can answer that. And a good question is one that offers people the opportunity to answer it in a dozen different ways. You know, what, what, what do you imagine to be a good question? Like what is, you know, not a closed-ended question. If you ask a question that's like, can be answered with one or two words, I mean, except in rare instances, right? That, that if you really want to get a conversation going, you, 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 that's called a closed-ended question. How are you feeling today? Well, good, <laughs> bad, okay, huh, all right. Damn, I got, okay, now I gotta ask another one. Okay, how are you feeling today? Well, what, what is it, uh, you know, what are you, how are you feeling yesterday? Like, you know what I mean? I got, but if I say, hey, what do you think's going on that really shapes how you're feeling today? Like, oh, huh. What's happening that's influencing the way you are feeling today? You're gonna say, you're gonna tell me how you're feeling and you're gonna say something about yourself. And that's a good question. And, you, and, and mind you, I'm terrible at asking questions, but I have a wife who's really good at it. That's her job. And so she's taught me. I'm a slow learner, but she's teaching me. Yeah, so a good question is one that people don't have the answer to. They can answer it in lots of different ways. And they have to stop and think about it. And you have no idea what they're going to say. That's a good question. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. If you could pass the mic to someone else. Who else would like to ask a question? Thus far, we've had two awesome questions. Hi, I'm an uh, undergrad st a student from sociology department. And I, uh, I think the Korean university education is really bad at like student-based learning <laughs> because, because I think that's on the um, role of university education in Korea because yeah. Uh, people recognize university as like rites of passage other than like fields of education. Yeah. So it's really kind of hard to let students to really learn the like learning method. So um, as a st student, I need m many courage to learn. And what's your advice for our students? Mm. Okay, so the first thing I guess I would say is, first off, it's not that different in the United States, okay? Really, your, your system here is really not that different than my system. Most teachers in my university teach the way most teachers teach here. Most students are the same. Most students, they expect to go in the classroom and take notes, and then they, you know, the whole thing. I mean, this is what it is. Um, I think if you're a student, And you have this feeling that I, I want more. Like, I, I just don't feel, I feel like there's something else, there's something calling me. Like, there's a way of thinking, there's a way of understanding, there's something that's calling me. Just ask yourself what that is. You know, like, what is it? Like, what, what do I want to know? What do I really want to learn? Do I even know what I want to know or what I want to learn? And so just lay, it, lay in bed at night. Turn the lights off and just lay in bed very still and think about the fact that you're going to die and you're going to go through the light all by yourself and no one's going to be along with you. You're not taking your parents, your pets, your friends, nothing. You are all alone. And that could happen any moment. And then ask yourself, what do I want to know before that happens? What do I really want to know? And if you don't have an answer... Then you ask yourself, how is it that I don't have an answer? Like, how did I get here? And then see, like, let me try to have an answer to that. And then, you know, you can do school the way you have to do school. Because, you know, you do. You have to study for exams and you do all the stuff that you do. But over here in your spare time, you could be asking, what do I really, really, really want to know? Who, would I, who do I want to be? Do I, want, do I want to have wisdom? Do I want to have, you know, what do I want to be? That's, that's what I would say. 
It's about the best I can say. Yeah. How about one, how about one final, I know we're, do you have one? Can you, right behind you, yeah. Oh, oh, heart is really pumping. <laughs> uh, Wait, just pull your mat. I hate to keep asking. Oh, okay, thank yes. you. Yeah. Is, oh, thank you, Professor. It is very honorable to me to take a lecture from you in this KU. Uh, the thing that I want to ask, uh, I understand your lecture, Professor, should not be defined as a teacher for giving uh, information. Not so, mm, Professor defined some kind of accelerator in the human resource. So, but in Korea, in education system, there, there, are, there are lots of uh, some kind of problems in structure thing. I think, I uh, think about my life, I was live as uh, some kind of class, of, some kind of class. Uh, teacher and the lecturer fill me in the lots of things and before the <laughs> oh, ah, sorry in, no. oh, <laughs> study oh, fill, fill my glass as, uh, as much as I can mm -hmm. and I pour down the test paper and that again yeah. that is so uh, my life and 25 years but I think that it should be uh, that I think that must change some kind of thing but I want to ask uh, to be a, a accelerator for the professor and the I think the student may uh, study not the information but a way to question some kind of thing that is the highest priority in the class. Mm. But I want to ask, what is, what is the prior thing to the professor? And what, what effort should I uh, concentrate as a student? That is my question. Mm. Mm. So the question is, like, what's important for professors, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, man, that, okay, this is one of the best questions, one of the most interesting questions I've ever been asked. And the reason it's interesting is because I can't, I don't possibly have an answer for this. Like this question is a kind of question that I would have to sit with for a long time to really come up with an answer. And you see like how, This is, that, this, that's the magic of a room. You, that's the magic of exchanging ideas. That, that I will, I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to try to answer your question, and we're, we're out of time, but I'm gonna tr try to answer it. But I just wanna say, this is the magic of a question that I will leave Korea thinking about this question that you're asking, right? And this is why I, do what I do because this, I want to be in the magic, right? I think, I'll say this quickly. I think that the role of a professor is to somehow scramble the minds of students in some way. Either give them something new Get, lay, lay it out with information. Give them something new that, they, that scrambles their mind and they take away. Or give them something that is like a bomb inside of their brains that explodes what they already think they know. So they have to go find the new thing. That's the role of a professor. And a lot of professors have the idea and I think the role of a professor is also to not be arrogant. Because the more you learn as a professor, the less intelligent you are. Because the more you learn, the more you understand what you don't know. And it's very humbling to be a professor. 
And the professors who are the most arrogant are the ones who have lost an understanding of what learning is. The, the more you learn, the dumber you get. And that's a really, really cool thing. So I'm hoping that on my deathbed, I will be just as dumb as I was when I was five weeks old, right? And I think the role of a professor is to acknowledge that and to remember that and to inspire students to get to that place. And some of us aren't really, we're not, we're professors, but we're not teachers. And some of us are teachers. And that's, that's what the teacher does. So it's hard. It's difficult being a, by the way, to all the students in here, it's my last comment. Uh, it's hard being a professor. It's really difficult. You know, because especially, it, well, it got easier for me that when I realized how much I didn't know. I was a young professor. First off, the fir okay, can I tell one? Are we going to, we, we, one final thing. The first class I ever taught was called Cybernetics and Human Ecology. Does anyone know what cybernetics is? Cybernetics was the study in the 70s of the ways in which computers, we were building computers to mimic, the, to be like the human brain, okay? It was like built the machinery of a computer. And that's how we built computers. So I got hired to teach a class called Cybernetics and Human Ecology. And they said, I said, well, I don't know anything about cybernetics or human ecology. And they said, well, you, that's okay, you'll be all right. I was 24 years old. And they said, I said, well, can I think about it? They said, no, the class meets in 10 minutes down the hall. I said, okay, I'll teach. So I walked in the classroom like this, and I said, um, does anyone know what cybernetics is? And they said, no, just like you did. I said, neither do I. And I said, this is a class called cybernetics. I said, so you know what? It's going to be really interesting 10 weeks. I said, but we got this. We're going to learn together what cybernetics was. And that was my first experience teaching, was to acknowledge to the room how dumb I was. I knew nothing about the subject matter. And then so I, I learned early on to say like, okay, we're all in this, so let's go. And I think that probably if more professors had that kind of experience, then more of us would be able to walk into a classroom and just kind of let the process unfold naturally. But, but sometimes you, you didn't want that. Like if you're teaching statistics, you want, you know, you need to be like, hey, well, here it is. This is how we do statistics. You know, that's what you need as a student. That's what we need. Okay, I'm done. I'm just going to say this. We, we, if, there, if there are any students that you, you want to, I know, you know, we're going to have lunch and do a couple of things. But if you want to have a, a couple minutes a, a little bit later, I don't know what time, but I'm, I'm, I'm le I have to leave campus by about 2.30 because I'm going out to, in Chung International High School to, to speak to students, and I need to be out there like by 5.30. So I have a little time this afternoon if anyone wants to meet or whatever, but thank you. I, uh, I, no, I should say, Kamsa Hamnida. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting and inspirational uh, lecture. So I do not want to repeat uh, the lessons, but uh, I think uh, the essence of uh, teaching is to inspire uh, students. Uh, but uh, I think uh, he's uh, very special in reaching that goal more interesting ways than other professors. <laughs> okay, so, uh, you know, as a way to thank him for his uh, wonderful lecture, please give him the second round of big uh, applause and cheers. Yeah.